Good morning, everyone. Uh, look, thanks for joining us. Um, I am joined again, once again, by my colleague, uh, Claude Collica. Good morning. Um, so thank you to everyone for uh, jumping online. We are very conscious that everyone's busy at the moment, so we'll try to keep this to our time limit of uh, having it wrapped up by 12 o'clock. But um, um, so I just did want to say as well, apologies for the uh, for the late start, we were um, um, just wanting to get a couple of technical issues sorted out because we're, for the first time, not only are we running this webinar to those of you who are online uh, today on Zoom, we're also streaming on Facebook. So, uh, but Serena just working on a few things there, helping us out, uh, and she's got that happening. Um, so, look, uh, today we're talking about um, knowing your numbers and at, uh, at Sounds pretty boring to uh, those people that are not accountants, but um, it is quite surprising to us um, when we talk to clients who who really struggle with understanding, um, you know, what what we think are fairly simple things, but um, um, you know, we don't ever expect other people to uh, to have the same knowledge and understand some of the things that we we take for granted as accountants in our industry. So um, we wanted to just run through some simple concepts, uh, help a few people understand things that may not um, uh, stand out to them normally and um, and just answer any questions. So um, so I will make a start. Um, uh, as I said, I am uh, I'm joined by Claude. As usual, we've got our uh, contact details up on the screen for you, but uh, hopefully mostly most people know us by now. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping to start today. We have kept everyone muted um, just so that we can limit any chatter. We have got a bit of detail to go through today, so I apologise if it is a bit uh, heavy going at times, but um, um, we will also be providing you with uh, copies of the, of the presentation afterwards, as well as a recording if uh, you'd like to go back and have a look at it. Um, if you do have any questions, please um, put your hand up via the, the chat window. Um, I may not um, notice it straight off, but I've got Claude and Serena keeping an eye on those th things for me as well. Uh, and as I said, at the end, we'll, um, we'll get um, into a, a bit of a Q&A so that everyone can, can um, um, you know, just uh, ask any questions that they do have. We'll do our best to answer them and we'll see how we go from there. So um, now our agenda for today, as I said, um, uh, we want to talk about why you need to know your numbers in the business. Um, so there are some critical reasons why you do need to understand those things. Uh, we're going to have a bit of an overview of some of the, the key reports that you look at. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between profit and cash. Um, you know, a lot of business people don't quite understand the difference between those two concepts. Um, some of the key drivers of business value as well. Uh, we're going to talk about limiting liability, protecting assets, um, adopting best practice in your business as well, just some of the, uh, the general concepts that we often talk to clients about. Uh, and we're going to wrap up as we normally do. Uh, we used to start the sessions with this, but now we're finishing them because we think most people are across it, but uh, we like to give everyone an opportunity to have a chat to us about JobKeeper and how it's changed and how it's likely to change again, I suppose, if, uh, if things don't improve soon in certain areas of the country. Um, and then we'll wrap up with, with uh, you know, what we can do to help you out, what you should be doing to, to um, internally within your, your business um, and any questions. So, um, you know, ideally over the next uh, hour or so, we want to cover the importance of, of knowing your numbers and an overview of, of uh, everything that underlies all of those things. So um, please make sure you take plenty of notes as well um, and uh, send through any questions as we go. So, um, look, I did want to just have a very, um, um, take a moment to sort of talk to a few of the people on the call today who aren't clients of our firm, who don't know us um, and don't know what we do. We are, you know, at the end of the day, an, an accounting and advisory practice. Um, so I just wanted to put up there some of our our core values that we talk about. Um, you know, we do talk about delivering results and our relationships with clients and how we see ourselves adding value. So um, we also pride ourselves on ensuring that um, our clients that we do work with understand 
the reports that we produce for them. They understand their business structures and they understand what's going on in their business. Um, it's quite frightening when we meet new clients and we, we have a chat to them and it's, it's very obvious that they don't understand how they're operating their business, why they are structured the way they are and you know, what results they're getting out of the business. So, um, so we do devote a lot of time and energy to, um, um, to making sure clients are understanding what goes into these financials. So I know we've got some people on the call today as well who are very, very financially literate. So we're not telling anyone how to suck eggs. We want to be able to just sort of, you know, we're, we're potentially dumbing down some of these numbers. So if you know all of this sort of stuff, uh, please bear with us. There's a reason why we're talking about these numbers because we want everyone to uh, become more financially literate and ideally understand what's going on in their business. So, um, so as I said, um, you know, please take some notes. Um, we will step through some fairly complex and comprehensive financial data. Um, it's all sample data, so we're not giving anything away, but, um, but just, um, you know, ask any questions that you do have. Um, so uh, to begin with, uh, you know, before us, before we do start, we thought we'd share a, a thought for the session. Um, um, and basically that is that the budget is not just a collection of numbers, but it's an expression of our values and aspirations. So um, that was a quote that we, we've come across previously. Um, hopefully um, in relation to budgeting, you know, not a lot of businesses or most businesses, I don't believe, prepare budgets. Um, the people we're talking to today, hopefully you've all updated your budgets and your forecasts in some fashion to reflect the challenges of, of what's going on in our economy currently with COVID-19. Um, these numbers express your aspirations for your business over the next 12 months. So now it's time to make sure you can understand, monitor and measure what you've set in those budgets and forecasts. If you haven't set a budget or a forecast, it's not critical or it's not a, it's not a death knell for your business, but it's important that you actually do start to sit down and work out what's happening. Um, this webinar really is about demystifying the most common reports that you see on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, or even annual basis when we produce it for you. Um, just so that you're more in control of your business performance. Um, out of interest, um, I would like to know from you all how regularly you produce and review your reports. Um, you know, is it weekly, monthly, quarterly? or annually. Um, there's no judgment here, just an interest in, um, in knowing who does what. So um, what I would like you to do, I haven't gotten overly complex here, but I, um, I would just like everyone, if you don't mind, just dropping into the, into the chat box, whether you do it, as I said, weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. Um, and I can see a few people already letting us know. So um, as I said, no judgment, we just, we're interested to know how regularly people are doing these things, if at all, um, and how they're finding it. So feel free to let us know. Thank you for that, for the, uh, for the guys that are putting their hand up and letting us know. It is, um, it's good to know because we're just gonna, we're not gonna lock you into any form of reporting. We're gonna talk more about the numbers that, um, that you, you are reporting on and how you can monitor them and how you can address certain things. Okay, so. Um, look, thank you very much for that. And again, if you haven't put it in already, and you, you know, if you don't want to put it in there publicly, you can send it privately or you can send me an email. So, um, look, what we now want to take a look at is um, um, what you need to know about your numbers. So knowing your numbers is vital as it allows you to interpret, interpret your reports and know if you're on track um, um, in achieving the goals that you've set out in your business plan or as we've uh, been calling it recently a business recovery plan, which you know we've sort of been working with people on. Um, look, we've probably got six reasons why um, you need to know your numbers, and we've listed them out there. They tell the story of your business. Um, they allow you to interpret the results of your business activity. Um, this helps you identify the symptoms versus the root causes. Okay, so. For example, a declining gross, gross profit is a symptom of many root causes such as ineffective pricing, rework, poor purchasing, wastage, you know, poor buying in certain areas um, or ineffective buying. Um, knowing your numbers will enable you to spot 
an early warning sign of a potential issue. Uh, for example, monitoring how long it takes customers to pay you allows you to quickly respond if that number starts to increase. Uh, areas of strength and weakness will be also be highlighted. For example, your balance sheet indicates whether your business value is going up or down. We'll have a chat about that shortly. Uh, understanding your numbers also means you have reliable, <coughs> excuse me, financial information to base your decisions on. And finally, uh, as we always say, knowledge is power. The more you know about your business, the better your business will be. Um, and we also say, you know, what you what you can measure, you can manage in our industry. So if if you um, are measuring something, you've got an ability to have an impact on it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just need a quick drink of water. Um, look, we want to take a look at um, some of your key reports in your business. Um, excuse me, we'll be reviewing each of these key reports to help you understand what you can learn from them. Um, we'll work through an example to show key learnings and things to look out for you in, in your reports. Um, and as I said earlier, we're using a fictitious company called Foods, Foods Manufacturing Company, I think it's called, for all of our examples. Um, so we're going to look at, um, you know, trading account, profit and loss, balance sheet, statement of changes in equity, depreciation schedule as well, um, and shareholders current account. Okay, so you might ask why we're looking at those, some of these reports. We'll explain that shortly. So um, to start with, your trading account tracks your sales, um, variable costs and gross profit to calculate the return you're achieving before um, you deduct any of your fixed overhead costs. Now your gross profit percentage indicates whether your margins are improving or deteriorating. Um, you can track your results across different divisions or different product lines. I know there's clients on the call that actually do that um, by using multiple trading accounts. If you're unsure how to do that, um, please have a chat to us. Um, for example, if you have regional locate or various regional locations, having a trading account for each location allows you to track how each is performing. Um, I know we have clients that have wholesale and retail divisions or they have a service and um, repairs and sales divisions. So there's various ways you can do this. Uh, small adjustments to the items in your trading account can have a huge impact on your overall results, um, which we want to be able to demonstrate. So again, if um, you bear with us, we'll run through some of these numbers so that you can see how small changes can have a significant impact on, on overall results. <clears throat> um, so this is an example of our, our Food Co trading account uh, that I referred to earlier. Um, so as you can see, they've got uh, sales of a million dollars and they've got costs of sales of roughly $318,000. Um, this uh, gives them a gross surplus or a gross profit from trading of just under $700,000. Um, their direct costs were just over $450,000. So their gross surplus in relation to trading was $248,749. Okay, so I'm stepping through this deliberately, guys. So just, as I said, just bear with me. Um, resulting in a gross profit of 24%. Okay, so that's not uncommon if you've got a trading company. So let's say this company undertakes some, some coaching with their accountant. I'm going to use us because it's simple to, to throw us up there as someone who might be assisting uh, with implementing certain strategies to increase, for example, customer retention rates, um, which result in a 10% increase in sales. Um, they also work to review their inventory processes and reduce their cost of sales by, say, 5%. Um, they then go further and they renegotiate their contract with their delivery provider, um, which again results in a 5% saving. As a result of these changes, you can now see that their gross surplus has increased by $140,000 and their gross profit percentage has increased um, by, um, from 24% to 35%. So as I said earlier, very small changes of 10%, 5%, and 5% result in an overall gross profit change of 35%. So understanding your trading account allows you to identify where small improvements can have a very large impact on profitability of your business. Um, so as I said earlier, 
You don't need to take these numbers down. You'll get copies of this to come back to. Um, but if you do have any questions on this, I'm happy to, to spin back to it um, later on um, and just go through these sorts of things. Claude, have you got anything that you wanted to, to add in relation to that? No, not really, Calvin. I mean, only just to reiterate what you were saying that, as you can see, everyone, that really you only need to tweak your numbers by a small percentage, whether it's in sales or the your cost of sales or, or direct costs, and you can see what a significant change in, in the numbers can occur. So some people have, a, uh, I suppose, a wrong impression that they need to make huge changes to achieve significant results. But like you were saying, Kel, this just shows that you know, just tweaking some small things can have a material difference as a starting point. Um, if you're interested in seeing how this, you know, these sort of changes can impact your business, um, if you're any good at Excel, you'll be able to do this piece of cake. Um, if you need our assistance, let us know. We can even run through some some um, um, financial modelling software if you really wanted to, to tweak it and see where you stand. But the simple numbers are pretty easy to work out yourself. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, look, um, I'm going to step from the trading account to the profit and loss statement. Your profit and loss, which most people are very familiar with, it's also now known as an income statement shows all of your earnings and costs over the year. It tracks the overall performance of your business. Um, it matches your income and expenses for the period with adjustments made for timing differences. For example, sales that have been made, but money that hasn't been received just yet. Um, you know, your debtors and your creditors. It's important to remember that profit is not the same as cash. Uh, the profit shown in your profit and loss statement includes non-cash expenses, such as depreciation uh, and amortization, as some people call it. Um, you must make sure you have sufficient profit to cover cash costs, such as loan, principal or repayments, asset purchases and drawings. Um, your profit and loss statement also provides a framework to benchmark your results by using percentages or comparisons between years uh, to compare your business performance to similar businesses. Um, we often do that or we've got the ability to do that, but primarily we will benchmark you against prior years and against targets that we set. Um, importantly, businesses are generally valued using a multiplier of earnings. So your profit and loss statement is a fundamental driver of the value of your business. Um, the higher your earnings, the higher your value. So that's a concept, again, we'll come back to shortly, um, but we want to keep uh, referencing that so it sticks in people's minds. Um, this is exa an example of a profit and loss statement using the same fictitious food manufacturing company. Uh, we've taken the gross surplus from the trading account uh, that we showed earlier and listed all of the expenses followed by the owner's remuneration to calculate the net surplus or loss, or net profit or loss, as, as we quite often call it. Um, so as you can see, the company is currently trading at a loss of over $113,000. So again, we get presented with a set of accounts like this and straight away we focus on this number and then work backwards to see what we need to do. Um, okay, so uh, let's say for example, this company undertakes a review of all of their expenses and identifies potential savings to be made to their, in this case, we've just picked on a couple of things, insurance and rent, okay? And they negotiate a 5% reduction for both of those expenses. Um, the result of that, again, this is not significant, but it shows that they've saved $597 uh, in insurance and around about $3,000 in uh, rent expenses. Uh, however, you will notice, and this is where we, uh, we throw ourselves under the bus here, that um, even though they've had a couple of savings here, they have um, their accountancy fees. Whoop, sorry, I've uh, hit the wrong button. Um, their accountancy fees have gone up, okay? So as I said, if they engage someone like us to help them in regard to these certain things, um, um, their accountancy fees have gone up by uh, $5,500. Um, however, despite this, the increase in fees and with the other reductions, the overall net surplus has increased from by $138,000. Okay, so they've gone from a, a net loss of 113 to a profit of $24,000. Okay, so that, 
as you would agree, and as we saw on the previous page, um, was a significant change overall. Okay, so again, I'll leave that there for a few seconds just so you can see. We, we took the change from the previous um, trading statement and we took a couple of tweaks that we made at the PL level to show a significant increase in the result. Okay, um, the next thing we want to look at is balance sheet. Okay, so your balance sheet is also known as a statement of financial position, which makes more sense to most people. Balance sheet doesn't mean a lot to non-accountants, um, but a statement of financial position provides a snapshot of your business's financial position at a specific point in time. And in our case, it's normally the 30th of June. However, as we said earlier, certain people will run you know, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly accounts to see where they stand. Um, balance sheet is a measure of the net worth of your business, which is your assets, less your liabilities. It also shows if your business is solvent, and that's a critical thing for us as well, for all business owners. If your liabilities are greater than your assets, then your business is um, known as being insolvent and urgent actions needed to fix this. Um, you can compare different periods to determine whether your business's net worth is increasing or decreasing. Um, between years and you can track the strength of your business. The stronger your balance sheet, the easier it will be for your business to survive a downturn. You'll often hear us talking about someone having a strong balance sheet or a weak balance sheet. Um, and it also provides a basis to calculate some key ratios such as um, debtor days, inventory days, those sorts of things. Um, so again, if we, if we look, um, as you can see, um, the balance sheet that we've got for our our fictional company, this company is currently insolvent. So as we said a minute ago, um, it has more liabilities than assets. Uh, its working capital is also negative as its current assets uh, are less than its current liabilities. Um, this means the company cannot, it technically cannot pay its short-term debts from the limited cash debtors and stock it has on hand. Um, so again, we would look at this and say urgent actions required to remedy this. Um, this business needs an injection of funds of at least $305,000 as it shows down the bottom, uh, which may be in the form of share capital or some form of loan, probably from a shareholder or equity owner. Um, so assuming the company can resolve these urgent solvency issues, there are other areas for imp improvement too. Okay, so what we'd be looking at um, would be um, the company could implement some strategy to reduce their debtor days and inventory days to increase cash flow. Okay, so um, again, we look at how you can release things or release um, cash flow from your balance sheet. Um, um, you know, we would straight away look at debtor days. So to calculate your debtor days, and we can all do this, so everyone on this call is capable of doing it, you divide your debtors on your balance sheet by your sales, and then multiply it by 365. So this tells you how long it takes your customers to pay. And this is quite illuminating to a lot of people who might say, well, we have seven day or 14 day terms. If they were your terms of trade and you ended up with this number of being 26, you'd probably get a bit of a shock. Okay, so currently this company's debtor days are 26. This means that on average, it takes customers 26 days to pay their bills. Okay. Um, similarly, if they updated their terms of trade and requested payment within seven days, um, to reduce this by five days to 21 days, they'd have an additional 13, almost $14,000 of cash immediately available. Okay, so again, I don't expect everyone to grasp this straight away, but come back and have a look at these numbers in your own business and have a look at what changes you can implement for yourself. Um, similarly, if you hold inventory within your business, um, to calculate inventory days, you divide your inventory level by the cost of sales, then multiply by 365. This tells you how long the business holds its inventory for before selling it. In other words, it shows how long your cash is tied up in inventory um, this, this company currently holds its inventory for 74 days. So this is in the old days, we used to call this stock term. So again, if you are in a retail business and you think you turn your stock over every 30 days, and yet these numbers tell you it's 74 days, it might make you take some 
um, urgent action. Um, so if we're looking towards improvement, uh, if they reviewed and updated their inventory processes and reduced the amount of inventory they have on hand, they might be able to improve their inventory days by nine days. Um, this would result in a cash flow boost of $8,000 roughly. So while this cash flow gain of nearly $22,000 combined doesn't fix their solvency issues, it does demonstrate how much cash could be saved with some help uh, if they looked at those sorts of numbers. Okay, so again, not going to dwell on it. Have a look at these numbers in your own business and see what impact you might be able to have on improving cash flow. Uh, statement in change of equity shows what happens to profits in your business. Um, so as we know, you make a profit in the business, these could be paid out as dividends or they can be paid or, or uh, distributions to unit holders or beneficiaries or they could be paid out um, or they could be retained in the business, sorry, um, for future use. Um, it represents the net worth or value of the company and is a key indicator of the company's financial health. Uh, it shows where, whether a company is solvent. Remember, if the company has more liabilities than assets, it's insolvent. Um, so you do need to get funds into the, into the business. Um, as we all know, a, a business can make a profit uh, and that money can all get sucked out or it can be left in the business for future use, for working capital, basically, as we go forward. Um, so um, in this case, we talk about our fictional company. Um, this company has accumulated losses. As we saw earlier, it was generating losses. So it's had losses uh, for the last three years. So this means the company has no retained earnings and is currently insolvent. And again, we saw that on the balance sheet, you'll recognize that 305,000. There's no money in this company to pay out dividends and no money to reinvest into the company to purchase new assets. So the directors or the owners of this company must take action now to increase the profitability. Um, the shareholder current account, again, this is linked to the equity area of a, of a um, the financials in a business. Um, it, this records all of the funds introduced to the business by shareholders or equity owners or taken out of the business's drawings. It can help you monitor your personal expenditure from the business and for businesses with more than one shareholder, it means a balance, maintains uh, balances of the amounts of each shareholder has introduced or withdrawn from the business. It also shows how much the business owes to each shareholder. And I'm referring to shareholders which usually um, relate to companies, but the same applies to equity owners, unit holders, partners, those sorts of things. Um, if the account's overdrawn, it means the shareholder has taken out more than they put in and now owes the money back to the company. Um, to put the account back into a positive balance, the shareholder can repay the loan or the company can increase its profit, or do its best to increase the profit, to pay a, um, an increased amount by way of salary or dividend to that shareholder. Uh, if in your case, if your shareholder account's overdrawn, it's important to get advice from your accountant as soon as possible to discuss the best options for you and your business. Um, it does open the door to other issues that the ATO usually come down on you about Division 7A loans, overdrawn entitlements, those sorts of things. So I'm not going to talk about that today. It's a bit too complex. Um, in relation to the shareholder current account, as we said, shareholder current account shows at the start of the period, the company owed its sole shareholder, Mr. Doe, um, $29,000. Okay. Uh, he's introduced $2,000 into the company uh, during the year, but has taken out over $9,000 from the company um, in drawings and life insurance. So this means at the end of the period, um, the company now owes Mr. Doe just under $22,000. So it still owes him, um, but it's less than what he was owed previously, okay? Um, the company, the amount owed by the company to Mr. Doe can only be repaid if the company is solvent and has the cash available to make the repayment. Uh, because our example company is in, insolvent, Mr. Doe will need to introduce more funds, correctly should be introducing funds into the company so it's not trading whilst it's insolvent. Uh, to ensure the company will be able to repay the debts introduced, or that, sorry, repay the funds introduced, a profit improvement strategy should be implemented so the company becomes profitable. For example, we demonstrated 
earlier in the trading account and profit and loss statement, some examples how some small changes can result in improvements. Um, in that case, it was $138,000. Um, so it's not sustainable for any business or in particular for the shareholders to keep introducing uh, money into a business if it's not profitable. So if this is the case, care does need to be taken. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes some harsh decisions need to be made about the future viability of a business. Okay. Um, <clears throat> fixed asset register. Um, it's also quite often known as a depreciation schedule. And again, that's an accounting term, so I'm trying to steer away from that. Um, records of businesses' fixed assets, such as vehicles, plant equipment, um, and sometimes land and buildings, <coughs> excuse me, and facilitates the spread of the cost of assets over their useful life. Uh, it provides a basis for keeping track of the business's assets and can be a useful guide to determine when assets need to be replaced so they can be budgeted for accordingly. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's also useful when selling a business as it records the current written down value of all fixed assets. Um, so I've put an example fixed asset res register on the screen now for you to go through. Uh, the first column of this fix fixed asset register um, shows the name of all the fixed assets with the second column listing the cost of the assets on the purchase date. So that's usually you know, what we call your original cost. Uh, the next column shows the opening value of the asset at the start of the financial year. This is the cost less the closing accumulated appreciate depreciation from the previous period. Um, the next two columns show any purchases of new assets or disposal of old assets. A disposal could simply mean that the asset has reached the end of its useful life and no longer holds any accounting value. Um, then we usually show the depreciation rate and the method used. Um, DV uh, refers to the diminishing value method which depreciates each asset by a constant percentage each year. Uh, and there's this next column shows the depreciation for the period, um, followed by the accumulated depreciation. This is the amount the, the asset has been depreciated by since it was purchased. Finally, we have the closing uh, written down value, as we quite often call it, which shows the current value of the asset um, after depreciation. This is the value that it will be recorded at in the balance sheet. So when we look at net value of assets, it will equate to, in this case, $297,000 total. So in summary, that sums up the, <coughs> sorry, in summary, um, what we've looked at is the six, six of the key reports that within your business, preferably you should be producing and reviewing regularly. Um, each report tells a different story about your business and aids your decision making in a different way. Um, if you have any questions about any of the reports that we've shown um, or any reports that you've produced in your business, please send them through and we'll, we'll, um, um, we'll answer them whenever we can. Um, in the meantime, what I wanted to have a quick chat about is the difference between profit and cash. Okay. Um, so it's quite common for business owners to get frustrated that their bank account doesn't seem to reflect their profits. Um, it's vitally important that you understand the diff difference between profit and cash and why a high profit doesn't necessarily result in more cash in your bank account. Um, a profitable business can go out of business very quickly because it's starved of cash. Uh, and a business running at a loss can survive because it has access to funds from investors or financiers. So in other words, cash flow is every every business's reality, okay? So I wanted to very quickly run through um, some differences between profit and cash. So uh, to demonstrate the difference between profit and cash, I wanted to consider a few items. So first up GST, it affects your cash balance, but not your profit. Um, loan repayments affect your cash balance, but not your profit. Uh, interest on loans, is an interesting, interesting one because it affects both your profit and your cash balance. Um, and people will understand because there's principal and interest in, included in loan repayments. Asset purchases only affect your cash balance. 
asset, asset sales only affect cash balance uh, and depreciation only affects your profit. So as you can see, even if your business achieved a healthy profit, there may not be any cash in the bank after paying tax, making loan repayments and buying new assets. Um, and if you sold some assets, that might help you. Okay, um, so I wanted to run you through what we refer to as the Business 101 cycle. Um, so this is a useful way to demonstrate the difference between profit and cash. Um, so to begin with, firstly, owners need to invest money in a business. Um, this money can then be used to purchase assets need to run the business. The business may need additional funding to buy all of the assets they need. So they may take a loan to finance the purchases. These assets are then used to generate profit. And that's effectively why you buy assets in a business um, is to generate a profit. Um, you can increase your profit by growing your sales or your margins, um, but overhead expenses can drain your profit and result in a loss if they're not managed well. So we go back to the earlier slides. Um, the profit then gets turned into cash. Um, drains on your cash include low collection of debtors, high inventory days, loan repayments, tax repayments, and payments to suppliers. Uh, a business can achieve gains by collecting their debtors faster, de decreasing inventory days, negotiating longer payment terms with suppliers and reducing tax. We talked about a few of those earlier. Uh, the owners then take cash out of the business as drawings, dividends or personal loan repayments. Um, and the remaining cash can then be reinvested into the business to purchase more assets to generate more income. Um, the aim, sorry, the aim um, <clears throat> sorry, the profit, get, uh, where are we? Sorry, I've lost my way now. Um, the aim is to go through the cycle as quickly as possible to increase your return on investment, basically. So um, again, this slide does take a bit of getting your head around, but it is common sense once you start to understand this and understand the drivers behind these parts of the business. Uh, and speaking of drivers after cash flow, business value is the next most important measure of, of business success. Okay. Um, so part of knowing your numbers is understanding and measuring the drivers of your business value. Okay. So these drivers might be your monthly recurring revenue, revenue growth, revenue per client, sales, profit. Uh, these will be different for every business as well. Um, but we're happy to work with you to identify drivers of your business value or I'm sure that most of you can sit down and say, all right, well, what does drive my business day to day, week to week, month to month? Um, enhancing business value, to enhance the value of your business, um, you have to first develop and implement a clear plan and document your organization structure and your roles within your business. Okay. Um, establishing Cloud-based real-time reporting allows you also to make better decisions. Um, so reviewing and documenting your systems and processes ensures your business is running as efficiently as possible. Uh, reducing the reliance on owners of the business um, helps to enhance the values. It will be easier for new owners to take over when the business is sold. What that means is um, it's almost impossible for someone like Claude and I to jump into any one of your businesses out there because we don't know um, or we can't do what you're doing if the business is reliant on you personally. Okay, so as soon as you can make, or the sooner you can make the business not rely on you personally as a business owner, the more value you've created. Uh, and finally, identifying and managing risks means these can be mitigated before they become an issue. Uh, again, we work with a lot of clients to, to manage and mitigate risk and reduce liability as well. So I wanna have a bit of a chat about that next. Um, and that really relates to, um, you know, protecting assets. So as we've seen throughout this webinar, profitability, cash flow and value of your business um, all affect you personally. Okay, so we're talking about your business, but they have a direct impact personally. If your business isn't profitable and doesn't have any, have much cash available, you won't be able to pay yourself to fund your desired lifestyle. Um, so at the end of the day, lifestyles, you know, why we're in, why we should be in business so that we have got a 
life and a lifestyle. Uh, so there's a few other things you can do to help protect your assets, which I'll quickly run through now. Um, uh, the first area we talk about is limitation of liability. Uh, one of the ways we look at is in some cases setting up your company or setting up your business as a company to limit liability. Um, we also look at um, uh, who should be a director in your business or who should be a principal in your business um, to ensure that uh, um, it's the right person uh, and it's not the wrong person, ideally. Um, we do need to ensure that you have security over any money that you lend to others. Now that could be, um, you know, not too many clients are money lenders, but it's got to do with supply of goods or services. So where you're, where you're supplying credit, uh, you may need to consider alternative ownership structures um, for your business or for high value assets. For example, if your business owns commercial premises that your business operates out of, uh, you might consider moving the ownership of these premises to a separate entity to protect it. Um, you may need to consider your terms of trade and the credit policies to ensure that you only provide credit to customers who are likely to pay you or you know, in an ideal world. Um, you may need to review your insurances as well and make sure you have sufficient protection. For example, do you have business interruption insurance, indemnity insurance, and also enough cover to ensure the impact on your business of any adverse events is as minimal or is minimised wherever possible. Um, financial planning, you do need to ensure you undertake financial planning to manage personal wealth outside the business. Um, and that includes things like income protection insurance, TPD, you know, life insurance as well. Uh, and finally, estate planning, you do need to plan for the future. Um, you know, do you have an up-to-date will, power of attorney, you know, and a clear plan for transferring your, your assets um, to the next generation or to whoever you believe you want them transferred to. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, they're just some of the ways you can protect both your business assets and your personal assets. Um, <clears throat> so we can assist you with it, with uh, specific ways to protect assets, particularly in relation to your business, um, but also protect personal assets when you are operating a business. So please keep that in mind. Uh, adopting best practice. Um, how does everything that we've talked about today come together as best practice? Um, look, there's many different ways that you can pull all of these pieces of the puzzle together. Um, but we essentially, we believe every business should have these three tools, okay? Um, so an annual business plan, it doesn't have to be war and peace. Um, but as we said, an annual business plan or an, a business recovery plan, as we've been calling it, um, are almost mandatory at the moment in relation to anyone in business. You should be looking ahead to see where you're going. Um, we're going to talk about JobKeeper shortly. At the very least, you should be contemplating what's going to happen in the next 30 to 90 days when JobKeeper um, ceases or, you know, at best reduces. So please keep that in mind. And in relation to that, you should be looking at an annual forecast going out three, six, 12 months um, to see what the future looks like. Uh, and you should also be looking at ongoing reporting and accountability. The reporting ensures the numbers you want to achieve in your plan and forecast are being measured. So we said earlier, what you can measure, you can manage. Um, so the accountability process is some form of coaching. So using someone independent as well, um, can help to make this accountability work for you in your business. So um, unfortunately, most business people are not accountable to themselves. Um, so quite often you need someone external to hold you accountable. Uh, at the end of the day, knowing your numbers is just the beginning as it allows you to improve them and ultimately to achieve the goals in your business. So um, look, that's really what we wanted to talk about today when we talk about knowing your numbers. Uh, we haven't had a really deep dive into all of the specific numbers. What I was hoping or what we were hoping to do was just get people to focus on some key aspects within your business. And at the end of the day, we always see that in any business, if you, if you focus on no more than five issues or five um, numbers in your business, that's enough. Okay, once you've got a handle on those five, you can perhaps expand, expand it, but 
don't go overboard on trying to analyze your numbers. If you end up with, uh, what's it called? Paralysis by analysis, where you do so much analysis, you go nowhere. So just pick the, the specific numbers that are critical to your business and that are going to have an overall, overall impact, okay? So um, keep that in mind. Um, talk to us about your numbers. And uh, my apology, I haven't been monitoring the chat. Um, so Claude's giving me the thumbs up to say, all right, we, we haven't had anyone come screaming at us with any questions, but happy to, to come back on that shortly if you like. So um, look, that's about it on knowing your numbers for the moment, but we'll come back to it. What I do want to do, I'm conscious of time. We've got about another 15 or 20 minutes, I think. Um, I did want to have a very quick run through JobKeeper, okay? Um, and again, I don't want to tell you things you already know, so I'm just going to keep it very high level. Um, so as we know, there's a number of people on the call, hopefully some people that are that are watching the, the live stream elsewhere who, <coughs> excuse me, are, are utilizing JobKeeper. Um, so you'll be well aware of most things that I'm about to talk about, if not all of them. So as we know, JobKeeper has been extended by six months to the 28th of March, 2021. Um, the initial period was due to end in about three weeks. So less than three weeks now, 27th of September, 2020. Um, so uh, requalifying, if you already qualified for JobKeeper uh, Mark 1, you do need to requalify. Okay, so that's a, a critical tenant to this. So the actual GST turnover rather than projected GST turnover as well um, is the key to this. So to qualify from the 28th of September onwards, uh, in particular for the December quarter, as we're calling it, businesses must show a 30% or more decline in turnover, and that's GST turnover, during the September quarter of 2020 versus September quarter 2019. So that's it. That's the one test that you need to pass. So they initially made it hard and then they softened it and made it a bit simpler. Um, to qualify from the 4th of January 2021, businesses must show a similar 30% decline um, during the December 2020 quarter versus December 2019 quarter. So they are very straightforward, but each of these new quarters you must requalify. Just because you qualified for the first, um, first series of JobKeeper doesn't mean you automatically qualify, Claude. Yeah, just wanted to sort of say that um, one thing to be wary of is that with the uh, requalification the first requalification period where it says it's from the 20th of September, um, just need to be aware that the quarter ends on the 30th of September, which is a couple of days after. So you just want to get all your affairs in in order so that you know what your quarter, September quarter data looks <coughs> like. Um, because yeah, because it does start a couple of days before. So you just need to be wary of those sort of tight turnover times for, the, for that first September quarter requalification. Thanks, Claude. Um, we have already, you know, been in discussions with some clients who have who have wanted to know whether they're going to qualify and ask for our assistance to um, to um, you know let them know whether they're they're likely to. I mean, we're not at the end of the quarter yet, but just trying to plan ahead to say, will you will you qualify? If so, um, what does that mean? If not, um, JobKeeper ceases. Okay, so just be aware of it if you're currently benefiting from JobKeeper there's a good, very good chance that it's about to cease at the end of this quarter. So again, we go back to the planning and the cash flows and those sorts of things that you need to be conscious of. Uh, there was a recent change in early August uh, in relation to employees. So from the 3rd of August, 2020, the employee eligibility reference date moved. Uh, it was originally the 1st of March, 2020, and it moved to the 1st of July. So what that was designed to extend employee eligibility for the existing JobKeeper scheme, as well as this new extension, as a new reference date applies for the last four payment fortnights of the existing scheme being the month of September, uh, August and September, sorry. Um, that was really done to allow for employees that weren't around previously, but had started work later than the original cutoff of 1st of March. So. Uh, and some of it was done in consideration of what's going on in Victoria currently. Um, the, the rules are, basically, they must be employed. 
um, and that includes whether they were previously stood down and then have since been rehired. Um, they don't qualify if they receive parental leave, dad and partner pay and a couple of other things. Um, they must agree to be nominated still. So this is, we talked about this five months ago, four or five months ago, um, and they must meet this one July test. Okay. Uh, so they must be a non-casual and they must be, you know, an employee on a long-term casual or, you know, regular or systematic, systematic basis. Um, again, there's qualifi qualifications in relation to age and importantly, they must be an Australian resident. So if they're not a resident, they don't qualify. Okay. Uh, important dates, the ATO announced the employers had until Monday 31st of August 2020. So again, this is in relation to that, that date that moved. Um, so that has now passed, obviously. Um, but what you needed to do was, you know, get the nomination forms in by that date. So. I'll allow you to come back to this in due course, but um, that was in relation to getting things done by the 31st of August, which obviously has passed now. Um, the payment rates um, as proposed in JobKeeper 2.0 um, still remain. The full rate of 1500 will drop to 1200 per fortnight. Um, and that's for the December quarter. Um, and the reduced rate for employees and business participants that do fewer than 20 hours per week um, is $750 and it will be $650. So, so there's some reductions from what we are currently um, benefiting from um, and they reduce um, progressively over the December quarter and then again into the March quarter of next year. Okay, um, so look, that's all I wanted to say on JobKeeper at the moment, Claude, have I, have I missed anything? No. So it's high level. Yeah. Um, we don't want to dwell too much on it because I think we've done JobKeeper to death, but we're happy to take questions if you have any. Yeah, no, I think that um, covers it all pretty much, Kelvin. It's just that, um, yeah, just need to be aware that with the new JobKeeper 2.0, um, everybody needs to re-qualify <coughs> to continue receiving payments after 28th of September. Um, so there's got to be a requalification process, very similar to the, the first round of JobKeeper. Um, and then if you meet those criteria, then you'll be entitled to extended um, JobKeeper payments for at least three months, um, but with reduced um, JobKeeper payment amounts as per the slide on, on the screen at the moment. Okay, thanks, Claude. Um, look, I'll, I will try and wrap up now if we can, although I'll allow some time for questions. But um, look, I really wanted to summarise that, you know, we're in some fairly um, challenging times at the moment. We've seen that, we're fortunate to some degree, but we're, we're still in a, a pretty tough period of time, uh, business-wise and economy-wise. Um, so our aim here is to help you to take what you've learned today and to implement some of the changes in your business. Okay, so, it's, you know, I'd, I'd suggest now's the time for you to decide what you're going to do as a result of taking the time to sit with us today. So I would encourage you all to take a few minutes after the webinar, or you can do it now if you like, to write down three actions or projects that you personally believe would add value to your business. Uh, you know, what problems are you experiencing in your business? Identify these problems or use them as an opportunity to create a project to fix them. Um, as we often say, doing nothing right now isn't an option at all. You can't just sort of sit on your hands and hope that everything turns out for the best. It, it's not the best way to go. Um, so please, you've you, um, committed an hour of time to, to joining us and we appreciate that so that you can get the most benefit possible out of this. Please take a few minutes to, to take some action and do something. Might end up being more than a few minutes, but at least take a few minutes to write down a few key points that you've found out today. Um, if you need our help, we can help you with business planning, cash flow forecasting, business coaching, uh, even management reporting. Um, you know, we've got our, our zero banner up in the background here. As you all know, we're very um, strong on, on zero. We utilize it day in, day out, hour in, hour out to, to assist clients on reporting properly in their business, understanding their reports. So talk to us about those sorts of things. And we're happy to have a, you know, offer complimentary meetings if you want to come in, have a chat as to how we can work with you. Um, so, you know, if you don't currently have a business plan or a, or a business recovery plan, 
Um, you know, we can assist you with those sorts of things. Um, you know, any form of these sorts of things that you do need help with, we can help you out on. Uh, we know it may be difficult as well if, you, if you're doing it tough out there to commit to spending any money. So talk to us about it. We, we don't want anyone being turned away because they think they can't afford um, both financially or time-wise to be able to do in these sorts of things. So please get in touch with us. Um, we're happy to work together with you to, to um, come, to an, oops, come to an arrangement to help you out. Okay, sorry, I've just uh, hit the wrong button there. Um, so um, look, what we've talked about today, this was intended to be an educational webinar uh, and it's general in nature. It's not specific. Um, or tailored to any one business or anything in particular. Okay, so we prefer to be working with you one-on-one -on -one where we possibly can um, to be able to identify the most important actions for you to take. So don't take any of this to heart. It's not aimed at anyone in particular, but take the message to heart and work on your business um, so that you can uh, make a difference, make a start and, um, and get a positive outcome wherever possible. So um, Claude and I always make ourselves available after these sessions. So if you wanna give us a call, drop us an email, um, or even raise anything in the chat box right now, um, I'm happy to take any questions. So, um, but whilst you're all sort of taking a minute, um, I do wanna thank everyone for making the time to attend this webinar. Um, we do appreciate everyone's time, it's very valuable at the moment. Uh, so we hope we've given you plenty of ideas to think about and some clear options for how we can support you in your business, how you can support your own business. Um, uh, I would encourage you to make a simple plan today. As I said, it doesn't need to be war and peace. Commit to at least three simple actions that you will take as a result of being here. Write them down, give each of them an owner and a completion date. Um, this is a worrying time for many businesses. Um, and for many people out there. So you don't need to worry alone. There is a ton of support out there, whether it's us, whether it's other people out there in the business environment, in, you know, your friends, your family, those sorts of things. Um, so, and there is more support coming as well. Um, but I encourage you all to seek out that support, seek out advice from others. Um, and please put your hand up. Um, coincidentally today is also you know, nationally, I think, or internationally, are you okay day? So again, we often are talking to our clients and we are just saying, look, are you okay? Are you okay personally, you know, mentally, business-wise? Um, please, we're here to help you as well. It's pretty tough going for a lot of people out there. So we are here to help you. We genuinely care about each and every one of our clients. And if you're not okay, don't be afraid to let people know. Um, you know, I'll happily, put my mobile number up on the, on this slideshow so that if if you do need to reach out, I'm happy to have a chat to you, have a coffee with you and um, and catch up at any, any time. So, um, so um, other than that, I will ask, are there any questions, Claude, um, Serena, do you? No, nothing's coming through. Um, if, that's, if that's it, I'm happy to close off. If anyone does want to raise a question uh, separately, shoot me an email, give me a phone call, um, come back to me at some point in time and, um, and Claude as well, and, um, and we'll happily uh, um, you know, help you out wherever possible. Um, as we've already said, Serena will shoot out an email to you, I think later this afternoon with a copy of the slideshow, so you can go through the numbers, a recording of this as well, and scarily enough, if this is being streamed on Facebook, it's probably there for prof future uh, future years to come. So that's a quite scary. So that's probably why I turned my video off a little while ago, but at least my voice is here. Um, thank you all for your time. Really do appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, to speaking to you all again soon. Have a great day and um, and I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.